Some say building a PC is a little bit like assembling Lego. That bit goes here, this bit goes there, and voila, we have a PC. To some, it might seem that simple, but to others, it's quite a daunting task filled with caution, anxiety, and even stress. Over the years, you could say that I've built quite a number of gaming systems both on and off the YouTube channel. Through that time, I've made a lot of mistakes and I've learned from them. I've also tried different ways of doing things to make the process easier, more fun and less stressful. So with that said, here's 10 PC building tips to hopefully address some of those fears and make your next PC building adventure that little bit more fun. Give yourself space to build a PC. There's nothing quite like cramping yourself on a small coffee table, being buried by copious amounts of cardboard boxes, getting tangled up in power supply cables, and losing that one retaining screw into the abyss, better known as the carpet. Find a decent sized table, lay out a nice desk mat, as this will prevent scratches, and only open the boxes that you need when you need them. Clutter will make the entire process tenfold more stressful, so take your time and be organised. Give yourself space. Having the right tools for the job is infinitely important now and when you come to upgrade later. Most people see a crosshead screwdriver and assume they're all the same. They are not. Having the wrong size screwdriver can lead to rounding off screw heads and slipping, which can even damage your hardware. A typical PC build should only require two screwdrivers. I'd recommend a solid PH2 for the fan screws and a precision kit with a PH1 for the motherboard assembly. Both of these are inexpensive but should last you a lifetime. Don't go rushing out and spending $100, budget for around $30 which will save you money towards your PC build. As always links to my personal choices are in the description. How tight is too tight? Remember that we are working with electronics and technology here, not woodwork and house DIY. We want our PC to stay together, sure, but we don't want to damage our components whilst doing so. Always tighten your screws until they feel tight enough, but never put force behind it. This is especially important with the motherboard. Just nip it up. Don't go so tight that you damage the solder around the edges. The same applies with installing fans. Once you see the rubbers pressing nicely against the case frame, that is enough. Over tightening fan screws specifically can lead to warped frames and excess vibration. Installing a CPU is one of the more feared stages of the build process. Those tiny pins are indeed fragile and incorrectly placed in the processor can destroy a motherboard. First of all, note the directional arrow on the CPU itself. This typically corresponds to the socket on the motherboard and can often be identified on the cover. Handling the CPU, carefully pinch it edge to edge without putting your fingers on the main contacts. Then carefully lower it into place. Placing down the retaining mechanism will come with some resistance. This is perfectly normal. Just push on through, making sure that the latches all make contact and the top cover will simply pop off. Now you can exhale and go make yourself a celebratory coffee. You did great. Thermal paste has one simple job. To even out the imperfections in the surface of your CPU and cooler to maximise contact and aid with heat transfer. Too little and your CPU will run hot. Too much will have a similar effect. So, how much do you actually need? Well, the internet will always tell you you're wrong, but the idea is to get a good, even spread. With Intel CPUs being less square and more rectangular, I find a narrow long strip to be the most effective. With AMD, one small blob slightly lower to the centre is adequate. Those feeling ambitious could opt for the spread it like butter approach too. Set your artistic side free. But, not like this. This is not ideal. <laughs> Finally, investing in a decent tube of thermal paste will be rewarding long term. Not all brands make it equal and the paste which comes with cheaper coolers can often go straight in the trash. 
I've used Noctua MT-H2 for longer than I remember, so that one gets my recommendation for now. So you need to install the RAM. You might have two of them in your hand, but there are four slots. Which should they go in? Well, the first rule of thumb is to utilize slots two and four. They are parallel and they will give you the best performance. Fun fact, you can populate four RAM slots if you need maximum memory, but two will always perform faster. Those in the creative space tend to choose four, whereas gamers often favor two. Installing them is really easy. You simply unhook the retaining latches, line up the notch on the lane with the RAM module, and then apply even pressure to them until they simply click into place. Try and maintain a straight downwards force to prevent them from wobbling side to side. Take your time with this and it's perfectly normal to feel some resistance as they click into place. When you purchase a new PC case, there will be a number of cables pre-attached to it. They usually comprise USB-A, USB-C, HD audio, and of course your front panel connections. Whilst the USB connectors may be self-explanatory because their shape helps to identify their position, the others may not feel so user-friendly. The HD audio is usually located to the far bottom left of your motherboard. Note the blank space on the connector. This corresponds to the header on the motherboard for the correct orientation. Front panel connectors are for the power and the reset buttons. These connectors will either come as a block, which looks a little bit like the HD audio, and install in a similar fashion, or as individual connector blocks. If you look closely at the bottom right of your motherboard, you will see the pin labels. These should correspond to the connector blocks in your hand. When in doubt, the user manual which comes with your motherboard will give you a clearer diagram of which pin is which. Think of the power supply a bit like the heart of your system. It's important that you don't overspend on this, but similarly, it's also important that you don't skimp out on it too. So what's the answer? Well, for most people, a 750 watt or 850 watt power supply will suffice for most builds. But those who are pushing really hard, let's say with an i9 and a 5090, they'll find more breathing space with upwards of a thousand watts. Something that's often overlooked with modular power supplies is their cables. Let's say you are changing your power supply to a new one. You might think that an easy shortcut would be to leave all of the cables attached in your case, disconnect the power supply and simply swap out the main unit while still utilizing the old cables which you took so much time to cable manage. Please do not do this. Different brands do not follow the same wiring schematic and while some have their own proprietary ports to prevent this from happening, Mixing different brand cables and power supplies can be dangerous for your system, risk of fire, and so much more. On that note, always keep any additional cables that you don't use in the original box. You never know, an upgrade later down the lines might require them. It's no good installing a top-mounted radiator before you've attached the power supply cables to the CPU headers you'll soon find yourself taking the radiator off again to get access. The order in which we assemble a PC can make a huge difference as to how smooth the overall process is. Of course, this will differ for many, but my short version from personal experience is always to build up the motherboard first by fitting your storage, processor, RAM, and cooler. Then we can insert the assembled motherboard into the case, insert the power supply, and attach all of the cables to the motherboard. After this, it's time to insert any additional fans, followed by the graphics card, and then, not to forget, the dreaded cable management. Of course, that condensed version sounds really simple, and clearly there's a bit more labour to it than that, so I would advise watching almost any PC build video on the channel to get a more comprehensive overview. Did you know, inside your PC case box, motherboard box, cooler, and just about everything you've purchased for your PC in fact, comes with a manual. Manuals are so valuable, but often overlooked. I remember once opening the manual which came with my old car after three years of ownership, and I discovered it had features that I had no idea of. Three years of driving that car to discover things I could have used through that time. The same applies to PC hardware, both during the building stages 
and the ongoing operation of your system. Manuals can help you make sense of the drivers you might need, the places things connect to, how to change something, or more importantly, provide you with the exact knowledge for the hardware that you are using. Building a PC can be a once in a decade experience for some, or a few times a year for others. Upgrading, exploring the world of PC DIY, and getting hands-on is a hobby, and with that comes with experimentation, getting things wrong, and discovering different ways of doing things. There are literally thousands of different hardwares out there waiting, and whilst I can't cover every single hint and tip possible, I hope this selection made that journey just a little bit more smooth for you. So, what are you waiting for? The next PC Builder waits. <laughs>